Welcome to the lecture on mathematical finance. In the last lecture, we discussed in detail the Cox Ross Rubinstein model. And in particular, we derived formulas for various kinds of different European contingent claims. In this lecture, I would like to focus on the behavior of the Cox Ross Rubinstein model when the number of trading periods go to infinity. And the question is whether we can derive more handy formulas for the arbitrage free prices, let's say, of a European call option. Let us have a closer look at that question. So, so what, what is, is the drawback of the formulas we previously derived? Well, well it's a kind, kind of complicated sum, and in practice, it's hard to evaluate these formulas when n is large. So, what I have in mind in that situation, suppose the maturity is a, is a time point in two or three years. And you would like to compute the arbitrage free prices, let's say, on, on not only on trading days, but let's say on minutes or even seconds. And then you see there's a huge amount of um, trading steps you have to take into account until you reach the final maturity. And then it becomes in extremely complicated to evaluate the formulas we previously derived. So the question is, can we take the following perspective? In that situation, it's easy to believe that maybe taking n to infinity might be a good candidate to approximate the formulas we previously derived. And that's why I would like to address that kind of question. So I would like to change a little bit perspective. So by capital T, I denote now the date of maturity, not the number of trading periods. So and then I consider the interval from zero to capital T. And that's my physical trading horizon. And I would like to partition that uh, interval into, let's say, capital M plus one um, time points denoted by t naught, which is equal to zero, less than t1, and so on and so forth, until t capital N, which is equal to the date of maturity. Meaning, I can explicitly write down what it is. ti is nothing else but i times capital T divided by capital N. And in order to simplify notation later on, I would like to abbreviate that ratio by simply delta of capital N. And then you see the ice trading period corresponds to the interval uh, ti minus 1 ti. And what I would like to introduce now is the following. I would like to introduce for each n a Cox Ross Rubinstein model, which are now indexed by this parameter capital N. And it consists, as usual, of uh, two securities one risky security as not n and one risky security as 1n. And the time points we consider here is are indexed by these time points we have chosen here. So ti and i is here now taken from the set en and en is nothing else but the, the set 0, 1 up to capital N. You see, we get back our classical Cox Ross Rubinstein model uh, with, let's say here, yeah, n trading periods. Uh, we just have modified slightly the notation, namely that we said we evaluate that model at these time points. And moreover, and that's important, we will choose the following parameters for the Cox Ross Rubinstein model, namely the parameter dn should, and so the parameter d is in the value, the amount we jump down should depend on capital N. The interest rate should depend on N and should be strictly larger than the N. And the upward steps should also be dependent on capital N. And under this condition, we have seen in theorem 3.1 that the resulting Cox Ross Rubinstein model is arbitrage free. So how to choose these parameters dn, rn, and un? So there are various different ways to do that. Uh, here's one uh, suggestion for the parameter, which are chosen on purpose to simplify slightly the computation later on. 
So first of all, the n I would like to choose as e to the r times delta n minus sigma times square root of delta n minus 1. And you see the difference between dn and un is simply I change the sign over here. So I have here the exponential of r times delta n plus sigma times square root of delta n minus 1. And the interest rate rn is simply defined as exponential of r times um, delta n minus 1. And clearly rn is larger than delta n because here we subtract that term and sigma is strictly positive. And clearly rn is less than un because we add here that term. So what we have done here, we have taken that interval 0 to capital T, we divided in, uh, in, in n parts. And now we ask what happens to the arbitrage replies in case that n tends to infinity. So meaning we are still on a finite trading horizon, namely that interval 0 to t, but the number of trading periods uh, increase with n. And then it's natural to ask, is there a limit? Can we describe that limit? Before we do so, let me remind you of various objects you have seen in an introductory lecture on uh, probability theory. So first of all, it's a reminder on the behavior of Gaussian random variables. So if you choose two random variables, x1 and x2, which should be independent, and x1 is normal distributed with mean m1 and variance sigma1 squared, whereas the second random variable is distributed um, um, according to a Gaussian random variable with mean m2 and variance sigma2 squared. And then um, it is clear that the sum of these two random variables, of these two independent random variables, you can describe its distribution by means of the convolution of the two distributions and the result in a particular case of Gaussian uh, distributed random variables is the following, namely that you end up again with a Gaussian distributed random variable. However, the mean is add up and the variance adds up in that particular situation. And there's also the following scaling behavior. So if you consider your normal distributed random variable x1, you scale it with a parameter square root of c, where c is simply a strictly positive real value. Then you get again a, a normal distributed random variable. However, its mean is simply scaled by square root of uh, c, whereas this variance is scaled by the parameter c itself. And we would like to use that property later on in the proof. A second um, um, important limit theorem I would like to, or notion of a limit, I would like to remind you is the following. Namely, I consider here a sequence, x1, x2, and so on, of real valued random variables defined on some probabilities based omega fp. And I would like to remind you that the convergence in distribution of the sequence of random variable to some limiting random variable x was defined, or one possible way to define it is in terms of the following, namely, for any bounded continuous function, the corresponding expected values should converge. And I would like to re remind you of the following. Note that the distribution of xn under p, which is used in order to compute this expected value, might be a discrete, brand, uh, a discrete distribution. However, its limiting distribution could also be continuous. And you are faced with this kind of particular situation when you address the question that a um, binomial distributed random variable properly rescaled converges to a normal distribution in the Moivre-Laplace plus theorem. So, and we would like to use that uh, in a moment. 
And here's another remark uh, addressing the behavior um, of, of smoothing a function, uh, which you might have discussed in analysis. So for that, I consider the following. I consider the radom nicodym derivative of the normal distributed random variable with mean zero and variance um, epsilon with respect to the Lebesgue measure. And I denote that uh, density simply by n epsilon. And uh, it's clear n epsilon has the following uh, formula. It's one divided by square root of two pi epsilon times e to the minus x squared over two epsilon. And it's clear that you can differentiate that function infinitely often because you only get that exponential function back and then you get the inner derivative which gives you a polynomial. And then you have to use the product rule so you build up uh, a polynomial times that uh, exponential term. But you see since that exponential term decays so fast that you can compensate any polynomial growth, it is clear that n epsilon is not only um, a C infinity function, meaning infinitely often differentiable, but also every derivative is a bounded function. And you can easily convince yourself on that fact. And moreover, um, if I consider now a, a function f which is simply con uh, bounded and continuous and I consider the convolution of f with that function n epsilon and I denote the result by f epsilon and if you don't uh, if you forgot about how to define the convolution of two functions here it is it's simply the integral of the function f against the function n epsilon where in the argument I shift it, uh, so if you plug in, evaluate f epsilon at the point x, then you simply shift the argument x by minus y, and you integrate that. And since this function n epsilon is infinitely often differentiable, you can also convince yourself that you're allowed to interchange the taking a limit with respect to x, and uh, taking that integral. So meaning you can interchange the differentiation and this, lim uh, this integral, you'd simply differentiate that function f um, and epsilon. And since um, you can derive easily a bound on each uh, derivative in terms of another Gaussian um, density with a slightly different parameter, and you clearly see that that resulting function is not only C infinity, but it's also in C infinity um, with bounded derivatives. And another observation is the following, namely that the sequence f epsilon, as epsilon goes to zero, converges again point-wise towards this function f. And if you uh, assume a little bit more about the function f, namely that it's also uniformly continuous, then you can improve that pointwise convergence to uniform convergence. And in the proof, we also will, would like to use that uh, possibility to smooth the function and the price we have to pay in order to get a uniform convergence, we have to ensure that the function f we are considering is uniformly continuous. So here is our main tool. It's a kind of generalization of the central limit theorem. Uh, in some respects it's a generalization, in other respects it's not. Um, namely, I would like to consider so-called triangular, triangular area. So what is that? So I give myself a parameter, capital N, and then I consider um, the following family of random variables, x1n up to xnn, and I assume that these random variables are independent and uh, identically distributed, but the distribution may depend on this parameter capital N in the following way. So first of all, I would like to assume that the random variables xin are bounded, pianos by this parameter gamma n. 
And clearly you would like to see where it enters in the proof and how to relax that condition. The second assumption is, due to the boundedness, it's clear that all moments exist. In particular, we also know that the first moment exists. And I would like to denote the first moment of x1n simply by mn, so it may depend on n. And likewise, it denotes the variance of x1n by simply sigma uh, squared n. And then I impose the following conditions. So first of all, this bound gamma n should converge to zero as n tends to infinity. Moreover, n times mn should converge to some real number m and likewise n times sigma squared n should converge to some number sigma squared in the um, open interval zero infinity. And once that is satisfied, then it holds true that some i from one to capital N of these random variables x i n converges in distribution to a random variable z, which is normal distributed with mean m and um, variance sigma squared. And these are exactly the parameters you get out here from that uh, limiting behavior. And to simplify notation later on, we would like to abbreviate that partial sum here simply by the random variable x capital N. And um, so maybe you, you have a different formulation of the central limit theorem in mind. So let us have a look at that. Suppose for a moment that mn is equal to zero. The, um, we have a sequence of IID random variables and the variance is equal to sigma squared independent of n. And so then it's clear that you have to normalize in the usual formulation that um, uh, partial sum by one over square root of n. And you see what we did here is the following. We, we absorb that prefactor 1 over square root of n in the definition of these random variables. And then we could come up with a triangular array. And clearly, if you assume that the random variables, the sequence, the infinite sequence you started with is bounded, then you easily can check that this gamma n uh, is an upper bound which behaves then like or which goes to zero like uh, a constant divided by square root of n. So that condition in that particular situation is rather natural. The only thing we have to assume here is this additional boundedness of that sequence. So let us address now the proof of that theorem. So it, it goes in two steps. So in the first step, so remind, uh, let me remind you, the convergence in distribution means that we have to simply prove that for any bounded continuous function, the expected value of f of that random variable uh, xn should converge to the expected value of f of that. But instead of starting with bounded continuous functions, I would like to start with a function f, which has at least three times differentiable, and every derivative should be um, bounded. And uh, then I would like to also introduce the following a triangular array of um, random variables that are one up to that n in the following way. So this should be i ID random variables and that i should be distributed according to a normal distribution with mean m divided by capital N and variance uh, sigma squared divided by capital N. And I would like to assume in addition that this family z1 up to zn is independent of the family x1 up to xn. And note that by the property of the normal distributed random variable, which I uh, discussed in the reminder, this partial sum of these random variables um, uh, zi which is simply a sum of um, independent Gaussians, um, behaves or is distributed according to a normal distribution where you add all the parameters. So we uh, have n times this parameter m divided by n. So that's why we get here parameter m. And likewise, we get here parameter sigma squared. 
So meaning that our limiting object, that, which is simply given by that um, partial sum, is uh, is exactly uh, or has this kind of representation. And we would like that to use that representation in the proof. And here comes the trick. So that's now the important step. I would like to define a new random variable w i n in the following way. So I take the partial sum j from 1 up to i minus 1 of these random variables z j n plus I take a partial sum where I start now from i plus 1 going up to n of this x j n. So I, I, this y is a kind of mixture of these two random variables from these two triangular arrays. And here's first of all a convention. So if i is uh, equal to 1, you see that first sum starts from a higher index, goes to a lower index, maybe from 1 and the, the upper index is 0. Then I, by definition that um, first sum is 0. So in, whenever you see that the upper uh, summation index is smaller than the the lower summation index, I define that by convention that it's equal to zero. And likewise, if I plug in for i the parameter n, then this term is not there. So why have I introduced that random variable w i n? For the following reasons. So first of all, observe that if I add to w i n, the random variable let i n, so then by definition it's nothing else but the partial sum j from 1 to i of set i n plus the partial sum j from i plus 1 to n of x i n. Now you see if I take now the last sum and well, no, the first sum and out from that sum, so the term x i plus 1 n, then I end up with a w i plus 1 n plus x uh, i plus 1 n, and this holds true for any i from 1 up to capital N, with the convention that when I plug in here the, the term uh, capital N, then this random variable is simply 0, and that random variable here, if you go back, you plug here in n plus 1, you see that's simply that first sum over here, whereas that sum is completely equal to 0. And the trick is the following. I can now write a kind of telescopic sum. So the whole proof ba is based on that telescopic sum. Namely, I can write down what is the difference between f of x n. So remember that x n was our abbreviation for this partial sum i from 1 to n of x i n minus our limiting object, namely f of that. So we would like to prove that that term converges eventually to f of that in expectation. So let us plug in, um, so uh, let us rewrite that x uh, n by a telescopic sum. So I, I first plugged it in what is the dif uh, a different way to write down that term. I mean that's w i n plus x i n. And I have a complicated way to write that, that namely as um, w n n plus uh, that n n and now you see if you add and subtract as uh, a term w 2 n plus x 2 n you subtract it you add the next term w 3 n n uh, plus x 3 n n and you subtract it and so on and so forth and you use that formula over here to rewrite this w uh, i plus 1 n plus x plus i uh, x i plus 1 n in terms of w i n and z i n you end up with the following uh, following sum let me sum i from 1 to capital n of the difference of f of w i n plus x i n minus f of w i n plus z i n and once we derive that representation now if we are on safe ground, it's clear what we should do. You see, we simply should use the Taylor expansion of the function f in both cases. So you see by that difference and the form of that difference, the zero order term 
will uh, cancel out. The first order term will have something to do with the mean, and we have conditions on that. The second uh, order term will have something to do with the variance, and we have conditions on that. And we only have to uh, worry about the remainder, which is then a third order term, as such this, that this remainder will vanish. So let's that, do that program in detail. So here it is the tail expansion of that function f up to third order of uh, uh, w plus a around w. So that's f of w plus f prime of w times a plus one half f double prime at position w times a squared plus, and here's a remainder in differential form, one sixth, so one over three factorial, f3 prime, so this is the third derivative, evaluated at a position w plus theta a times a cube, where theta is simply chosen uh, is a particular point um, in the interval uh, 0 and 1, and it depends on w and a. So let's plug in the Taylor expansion in that sum over here, and let us take expectations on both sides. So then we end up with the following. So this difference over here can be bounded from above using the identically distribution and the independence by the following. So using the independence, I first of all get, so the zero order term clearly cancel out. So what about the first order term? So now comes here the wonderful thing. Remember that W i n is a sum where the term x i n is not appearing. Meaning, so this uh, expected value of f prime w i n times x i n minus that i n coming from that term, that difference here is independent of that random variable. So here I can use the independence to get two uh, expected values. And then I do the following, I bound that um, um, product of two uh, expected value by the modulus of the, uh, by the expected value, and then I take the modulus, modulus is outside, and then the first term I can take by trying the inequality the modulus inside the expected value, and then I can bound that simply by the f infinity norm, and then the, the, the l infinity norm, of the so by the supremum of the function f prime and by assumption we know that f prime is a bounded function so meaning um the supremum norm of f prime um, exists in this finite so i take that out so i only have to worry about that difference but you see the expected value of x i n simply m n the expected value of that i n is nothing else but m divided by capital n and likewise, you get an expression for the second derivative. So again, we use independence to get rid of that uh, second derivative of m, which is again bounded. And then you end up with the expected value of x i n squared, which is nothing else but the variance plus the first moment squared, which is nothing else but by assumption as sigma n squared plus m n squared. And the second moment of x i n is nothing else but the variance sigma squared over n um, plus um, the first moment m divided by n squared. And the remainder now has the following structure. So here I took the modulus inside, so I get the third derivative, which I can immediately get rid of. And then I'm left with the expected value of the modulus of the third derivative of x i n, but this I can now bound in the following way. I can bound write that as the modulus of the x i n times the modulus of x i n squared. So um, as the modulus of x i, I can bound by gamma n, and what is left, what I have left with, is simply the, um, the variance. No, uh, the second moment of x i, but this I know it's uh, simply bounded by 
assumption by sigma squared n plus m s squared n. And I did that uh, estimate um, on purpose. I could also bound that down by gamma and q. However, I, this now becomes clear why we have uh, so to say what you have to change later on if you want to improve that result. And for the second term, I do the following uh, well, similar thing. I bound that remainder term simply by the supremum norm of the function f um, uh, three prime times. And now I take advantage of the um, scaling behavior of a, a normal distribution. Namely, I know that x i n is in distribution the same as um, that i n is in distribution the same as z divided by the square root of n. Now I take that cube, so I get the a modulus of a standard normal distribution. Oh no, a, a, a not standard. I get the cube of a normal distribution with mean m and variance sigma squared divided by n to the 3 half. So once we derive that, now we can pass to the limit. So I take the modulus of the difference of the expected values. I take the sim lim sub because we yeah, have done a lot of um, estimates from above and in order to ensure, so the lim sub always exists, the limit we don't know yet. So in, in passing to the limit, you see I end up with the following. I have here the lim sub of f so the infinity norm of f prime times the difference between n times mn minus mm. I get one half times the infinity norm of f2 prime times uh, n times sigma n squared plus n times mn squared minus here I subtract uh, sigma squared plus m squared over n. And then I have this remainder term. So now let us have a look at uh, these um, terms separately. By assumption, we know that n times mn is converging to m as n tends to infinity, meaning that first term vanishes. What about the second term? We also know that n times sigma n squared converges by assumption to sigma squared, so this part vanishes. And we also know that if you now multiply uh, that term over here by n and you divide by n, then the uh, numerator converges to m squared. However, if you divide by n, you see that term over here goes to zero and that term over here goes to zero as well. So also that second bit vanishes. So what about the remainder? So in the remainder, we have seen that this gamma um, n goes to zero and we are left with here with this n times sigma n squared, which converges to sigma, plus m n times m n squared, which converges to zero by the same argument as here. And the last bit is now we know that the third moment of a um, normal distributed random variable, so the absolute, uh, the modulus of that, uh, has finite expectation, and that is independent of n. So we have that prefactor 1 over square root of n due to the fact that we have here still the sum over n terms which gives us an additional factor n and that's why we have n divided by n to the 3 half gives us exactly this uh, uh, 1 divided by square root of n and that term vanishes again. So we have proven in a first step that for um, function f which is in uh, three, uh, uh, which is three times differentiable with bounded derivatives that the expected value of f of x n converges to the expected value of f of z because the lim inf is clearly of that object is clearly zero and then you have lim inf and lim sub converging to the same number namely zero and that's why we conclude that it's, we have a convergence here. So we are left with one step, namely how we could improve the differentiability. Remember that in the definition of convergence in distribution, we have to start with a function f, which is simply continuous and bounded. So clearly by the remark we have before the 
um, theorem, we can improve the differentiability of f simply by considering the convolution of f with the density of a normal distribution with uh, mean zero and variance epsilon. And here epsilon is a parameter which is strictly positive, but which is fixed. And doing so, this function f epsilon is now in C infinity um, function with bounded derivatives. So how to use that? Well, let us consider the difference between the expected value of f of xn minus the expected value of f of z. So now using um, now adding and subtracting the term expected value of f epsilon of uh, xn and subtracting it, we get the following terms or the following upper bound by using a triangular inequality. First of all, we get the modulus of the difference of the expected value of f epsilon xn minus the expected value of f epsilon z. And by step one, we know that z term will converge to zero as n tends to infinity. And here are two remainders, namely the expected value of f minus f epsilon evaluated at the position xn um, minus the expected value of f minus f epsilon and um, evaluated at that position z. And now we have to, now we would like to take uh, advantage of the fact that when epsilon tends to zero, f epsilon is converging to f. However, that convergence was only pointwise. So how, uh, in general, so only if f is uniformly continuous, we have a uniform convergence and uniform convergence we are after in that place because of the fact that we would like to first perform the limit n tends to infinity. And um, for that, we need here a, a certain uniformity in these parameters. So how to do that? Well, let us do that in the following way. So I would like to introduce two indicator functions. So let us have a uh, look at that term first. So the modulus of the expected value of the difference between f and f epsilon evaluated at the position x capital N. So by multiplying with the indicator function that the modulus of x n is bounded from above by some parameter capital K, we then have here the argument is now restricted to the compact set minus K. K. We know that every continuous function on a compact set is uniformly continuous. Hence, we can take out um, the supremum over all x in this compact interval of fx minus f epsilon x, and we are left with the indicator function that x n is bound from above by capital K. But that, um, this term we can bound clearly from above by 1. And we know by the remark before that we have a uniform convergence provided the function f is uniformly continuous, but on that compact interval f is uniformly continuous. Hence, here we have the desired uniformity um, which we needed. So what we are left with is what happens uh, when, the in, when the random variable xn exceeds the value k. So what happens on that event here? But then I do something really brutal. I can bound the modulus, um, uh, this difference here simply by the supremum norm of f and the supremum norm of f epsilon, but the supremum norm of f epsilon is nothing else but the supremum norm of f due to the fact that the integral over the um, density n epsilon um, is equal to one. So, and now what can we say about that probability over here? So the probability of the event that xn exceeds the value k. So here we use simply Markov inequality to bound that from above by one divided by k squared times the second moment of the sum i from one to n of x i n then of that random variable by independence we know that this sum over here is the same as the sum 
i from 1 to n of the second moment of x i n, which we can control. Namely, that's nothing else but um, n times the sigma n squared plus n times m n squared. So, and we know that this term then converges to some number uh, sigma squared. So, we have a control on that as n tends to infinity. So, here I have written that down. So, that's simply the variance and the first moment squared. Likewise, we can also proceed with that random variable or this expectation uh, this expected value of that random variable over here. And we get again and this as an upper bound the supremum over all x of the difference between fx and f epsilon x times this probability, which clearly we can bound again from above by one. And we get uh, the probability of the event that the modulus of this um, normal distributed random variable with parameter m, and so this mean m and variance sigma, exceeds the value k. So now let us first apply step one, and we take the limit as n tends to infinity. And as I said, in that um, using that triangle inequality, that first term vanishes. We're only left with these two terms. So we get as an upper bound two times the supremum's norm of the difference between fx minus f epsilon x plus two times the supremum norm of f times sigma squared plus m squared divided by k. So this comes from that term over here. Yeah. Uh, plus um, the probability that the modulus of that uh, exceeds the value k. Here's a typo. I will correct that. And you see, that bound is not going to zero in n so far. However, we can now do the following. We can now perform the limit as epsilon goes to zero. By doing so, we see that that term vanishes. Since that term here is uniformly bounded in epsilon. And then we perform the limit as k tends to infinity. And then we see that term is going to zero as k tends to infinity, and also that term is going to infinity uh, to zero as k tends to infinity because we have here, um, we know that the and uh, the tail of this distribution uh, has to vanish because the integral over um, uh, the modulus of that is equal over all k which are positive is equal to one. So and in that way, we then conclude the proof. And you have seen in the, in the proof that we use the boundedness of the random variables x1 up to xn only at one particular step, namely at that step over here, in that part to control that remainder. And this you can clearly improve uh, in the following way. So if you only assume that the random variables x1 up to xn are in L2, with respect to some probability measure. And then you cannot uh, expand up to the third uh, order, this function f as a Taylor series, but you should stop at the second order and you should take into account the re resulting remainder. And then you use um, that the remainder is uniformly continuous due to the fact that f is in C3 and then you can take advantage of the uniform continuity to conclude that proof. Okay, so this was the generalization of the uh, central limit theorem. Now let us apply that in our um, uh, financial situation. So here again, so I fix the parameter capital N. Now I consider a cox ross rubinstein model as specified above indexed by this parameter n, capital N, and I consider now a European contingent claim, which is particular, which only depends on the terminal value of our um, risky security. Namely, it's simply a function f of s1 capital N tn, which is nothing else, but tn is equal to capital T. And in that way, this is nothing else as a price of our 
risky security at maturity. And I would like to assume that the function f is a bounded continuous function. So and then I would like to compute the price, the arbitrage free price of this particular European contingent claim in the limit when n tends to infinity. And I claim that the result is given by the so-called black skulls price, uh, which I would like to denote by V S10 and T. So it depends on the uh, price of the risky security at the initial time point zero and of the date of maturity. And this, this value here is defined in the following way. It's e to the minus r times capital T times the expected value of f of x times e to the z, where z is simply a normal distributed random variable with the mean r minus sigma squared over 2 times capital T and variance uh, given by sigma squared capital T. And you can write down explicitly how that expected value looks like, namely that's e to the minus rt times this integral of the function f of x. And now you see we have here exponential of r minus sigma squared over 2 times t plus sigma times square root of t times uh, y. And I integrate against a standard um, against the density of a standard normal distribution. So how to uh, prove that theorem using the center limit theorem for triangular errors we just derived. So first of all, so let me remind you the price of a European contingent claim of a cox ross rubinstein model equals the price of the discounted uh, European contingent claim, which is nothing else but the function f of um, S1n evaluated at the time point capital, uh, at the time point Tn divided by S0n divided at the time point T capital N, which is nothing else but capital T, not N. Here's also a typo. And uh, now let's plug in all the parameters we have. So that um, term over here simply gives us uh, the following um, expression. It's 1 minus Rn. And how many trading periods we have? We have capital T trading periods, meaning we get here the power minus capital N. Uh, and then we are uh, end up with the following expected value under the unique equivalent martingale measure, which now also depends on capital N, of the following expression, f of st0, uh, 1n, so the initial price. So this is nothing else but s10. And then we have here the uh, product of these returns, which also depend on this parameter capital N. And these returns we can also write down as the upgoing steps and its number of upgoing steps to the power. Namely, here we simply count how often the random variable u n takes the value 1. And we multiply that by uh, the size of the downgoing step to the power um, sum n from 1 to capital N the indicator function that un is equal to minus 1. And now let's plug in the precise parameter we have. So we know that rn, going back, was simply given by the exponential of r times delta n. So delta n was nothing else but t divided by capital N minus 1. So the minus 1 will cancel the plus 1. The same holds true for dn and for un. And then you see we end up with the following formula, namely that's f of, so first of all, the prefactor is simply this e to the minus r capital T. And in the expected value, we have f of s10 times, um, uh, times the exponential function of the sum n from 1 to capital N of r uh, times t divided by capital N plus 
sigma times the square root of t divided by capital N. So this was delta N. This is the square root of delta N multiplied by u N. So and we have here now our candidate for, um, for our random variable which depends on n, which we use then in the uh, central limit theorem for triangular arrays. And we also know that under qn, these random variables c1 up to un are um, independent and identically distributed. And the, prob the qn probability of the event that u1 takes away 1 is equal to this parameter qn, which was nothing else but the ratio between rn minus dn divided by un minus dn. So what we should do next is we should have a closer look at that parameter, how that parameter behaves in the limit as n tends to infinity in order to verify uh, the assumptions of the central limit theorem for triangular arrays. So I would like to show first that qn asymptotically behaves like one half minus sigma over four times the square root of capital T divided by n plus the error term which goes to zero as one over capital N. So here's the first tiny trick. I can write the exponential function e to the minus x as one half e to the x plus e to the minus x minus one half e to the x minus e to the minus x. Why? You see the e to the x term cancels out due to that minus sign. And that minus sign with that minus sign gives us a factor two times e to the minus x, which cancels then the prefactor one half. So we end up here. So why have I done that? Well, that term over here is nothing else but the cosine hyperbolicus of x, whereas that term over here is simply the sine hyperbolicus of x. So meaning, if I now consider qn, which was nothing else but rn minus dn divided by un minus dn, and I plug in the definition of rn, un, and dn, I end up with the following. So the minus one and all these expressions cancel out. I have here e to the rt minus e to the rt minus sigma times square root of t divided by n. And in the uh, um, below we have the following expression, the exponential of r times t plus sigma times square root of t over n minus e to the r t minus square root of m t over n. You see, first of all, all these r times t terms cancel out, so I end up with that expression. Now you see the, what we have here is nothing else but up to factor of two, the definition of the sine hyperbolicus evaluated at the position sigma times square root of t divided by n. Whereas using that formula over here, we clearly get the term um, cosine of sigma times square root of t divided by n minus one. And then we get here also that um, term um, sine of x, so with that minus sign over here, we, um, we cancel that out with uh, the term we have here and we get that term one half. So that's already the term one half we would like to see. So before doing now a tail expansion of that term, I would like to manipulate it in the following way. I multiply and divide by the following expression, namely the cosine hyperbolicus of sigma square root of t divided by n plus one. So then using the third binomial formula, that term over here multiplied by that term over here gives me clearly sigma squared, uh, a cosine hyperbolicus squared evaluated at the position sigma times square root of n minus one. And now I can use um, uh, the following uh, formula, namely that the cosine hyperbolicus squared of x minus the sine hyperbolicus squared of x is equal to one, which allows me to rewrite that cosine hyperbolicus minus one 
So bringing that minus one over here and the sine hyperbolic square squared over here in terms of the sine hyperbolic squared. And then you can see that you can cancel out one sine hyperbolic squared. And I don't get a modulus here because I know that sigma n the square root of uh, t divided by n is positive, meaning also this sine hyperbolic is positive. So I get as this expression the following term, one half minus one half times sine hyperbolic of sigma square root of um, t over n divided by cosine hyperbolic of sigma times square root of t divided by n plus one. And that term over here I would like to abbreviate by q of square root of t divided by n. And what I would like to do now is I would like to perform a Taylor expansion of that function q around a zero. So in the, you see the zero order term is simply plug in a zero. Sine hyperbolic of zero is zero. Cosine hyperbolic of one is simply one. So you get here one plus one is two. So zero divided by two is fairly fine. So we get here the zero. And you see why we did all these steps. If you do that at that place, you have here expression zero divided by zero. So you have to argue first why that, what is that kind of limit? So let's compute the uh, first derivative of that term. So using the, the um, formula for a differentiating a quotient and using that formula over here, you end up with the following expression, namely that uh, sigma over two times one over uh, cosine um, of sigma times x plus one, and you evaluate that at a position uh, that x is equal to zero, meaning this term is zero, uh, this term is one plus one, so you get here a sigma over four times x, and then you get all the higher order terms, which is O of x squared, as when x is small. And hence, once you plug that in, evaluate that at the position square root of t divided by capital N, you end up with the following formula, namely that qn is nothing else but one half minus sigma over four times square root of t divided by n plus big O of one over um, capital N. So we have under control the parameter qn. So now let us define the following random variables ui of capital N simply as r times t divided by n plus sigma times square root t divided by n times un. And you see that's exactly that random variable which is appearing here in that partial sum. And Obviously, we can bound that random variable from above simply by taking using triangle inequality and bounding the modulus of u i by one. I get the following expression: that's r times t divided by n plus sigma times square root t divided by n. And I would like to denote that term over here simply by gamma n. And obviously, gamma n will converge to zero as n tends to infinity. So what about the mean and the variance of the random variable u i of n under this measure q n? So let's compute that. So let us plug in here the definition of u1 of n. Let me remind you that's that constant times that term over here. So taking that constant out uh, and that constant over here, we end up with the expected value of the random variable u1 under this measure qn. u1 takes only two values, plus or minus one, so you get here, uh, in case it takes a value plus one, you get the value qn, and takes, in case it takes a value minus one, you get the, the factor one minus qn, and you see that term over here simply simplifies to two times qn minus one. And now let us plug in the expansion we have derived for qn, which was nothing else but one half minus sigma over four times the square root of t divided by n times higher order terms. Doing so, you see the one half is cancels out 
multiply z minus 1 and you're only left with the term minus sigma over 2 times the square root of t divided by n. So if you plug that in and you combine that with z term over here, you see that the leading order term is um, r times uh, r minus sigma squared over 2 times t divided by n plus an error term which is of order um, n to the minus 3 over 2. Likewise for the variance, so the variance of qn is nothing else but the variance of this random variable u1 under qn times this factor a sigma squared divided uh, times t divided by n. And the variance of u1 is easily computed. It's um, the second moment of u1, which is equal to 1, minus the first moment squared. The first moment squared we have seen is 2 times qn minus 1. And we have seen that that error term over here is of the order square root of t. So we have here 1 plus O of 1 over square root of n. And combining with that, we see the leading order term comes from that 1 over here. So we get here sigma squared times t divided by n plus O of um, um, 1 over n squared. So remember that we have here that power 2, which squares that term. That's why we get here um, O of 1 over n squared. And now, now you see all the assumptions are satisfied. Gamma n, as I said, converges to zero. n times m n, you see if you apply, multiply that by n, it converges to exactly that term over here, namely the difference of r minus sigma squared over 2 times capital T. And that error term still, even if I multiply that by capital N, goes to zero. And likewise in that situation. Hence, the previous theorem tells us that the sum i from 1 to n of u i n converges in distribution to a Gaussian and random variable with mean um, r minus uh, sigma squared over 2 times t and variance sigma squared times t. And in particular, for any bounded continuous functions, this simply means uh, that the expected value of f of that function converges to the expected value of f of that function. So in particular for our uh, European contingent claim, it means that um, the price, the arbitrage price converges to the e to the minus r times capital T times the expected value of f of s10 times e to the z, where z is exactly z normal distributed random variable. And now in order to get the second formula, let us first write down z expected value explicitly. So that's the integral of f of s10 times e to the z, little z, and integrated against the corresponding Gaussian density. And what I would like to do now, I would like to do here a substitution in such a way that I get here the density of a standard normal distribution out. And for that, I have to do the following. I replace um, in here z minus z uh, term over here divided by the square root of that term by a random variable. Uh, no, by a parameter y. So meaning y is substituted by that term. And if you now compute what uh, dz is in terms of dy, you see that you end up exactly with the corresponding normal, standard normal Gaussian um, density. And you see if I now write, rewrite um, z in terms of y, so I multiply by z term and I bring z sum and over here to the other side, I simply end up here with the integral of f of s10 times the exponential function of, and now I replace that by r minus um, um, sigma squared over 2 times t plus um, sigma times square root of t times y. And that was exactly the function uh, v of s10 times t, so the Black-Scholes price of our limiting 
arbitrage free price of the Euro this particular choice of European Union contingent claim. So let me apply that, I would like to apply that theorem to a European Union call option. But there's a caveat. You see the European Union call option was simply um, S1 capital T minus K and the positive part. So clearly that's a continuous function, but it's not bounded. So and here in the theorem we explicitly use that that function F is a bounded continuous function. So what to do? So and that's that question I would like to um, address in this last corollary, and that's the derivation of the famous Black Scholes formula. So again, I consider a sequence of a Cox Ross Rubinstein models S bar n, which we specified at the beginning of the chapter, which has the parameter dn, un, and rn. And now I consider a European call option, namely that's nothing else but S1n divided by Tn minus k. And remember that S, uh, uh, Tn is nothing else but capital T, so that's what we have written here is really uh, S1 capital T minus k positive part. The n only plays a role with respect to what kind of um, equivalent martingale measure we compute the arbitrage free price. So, and then it holds true that the limit as n tends to infinity of the um, arbitrage free price of that call option converges exactly towards the same formula we derived previously in the theorem, namely exponential of minus r times capital T times the expected value of the positive part of the difference between s10 e to the z minus capital K, where the z again is that a normal distributed random variable with mean r minus sigma squared over 2 times capital T and variance sigma squared times t. And it's exactly, so that formula I would like to abbreviate by v colon capital K of s1 0 times capital T. And in particular, I can simplify that expression a little bit more. I can write it as um, the following difference, namely that simply S10 times the distribution function of a standard normal distribution evaluated at a position minus h plus sigma over 2 times square root of t where h is simply that parameter over here, depends on s10 and it depends also on t and these parameters r and sigma and the drive price, uh, minus e to the minus rt times k times the normal distribution or the, the density function of, no, the distribution function of a standard normal distribution now evaluated as the parameter minus h minus sigma over two times square root of t. So you see these arguments only differs by one minus sign. So how, so it's clear we cannot immediately apply the previous theorem. Nevertheless, the result is as if we could apply it. So you see that's exactly the same formula we just derived. However, we should proceed in the proof slightly differently. And the trick is the following. So we do that in two steps. So we can write down or rewrite the function x minus k positive part also in terms, terms of x minus k plus k minus x positive part. Why is that true? Now let's have a look at that. So if k is larger than, and so if x is larger than k, this term is, uh, vanishes. So we get back k x minus k, and this is the same as that expression over here. Whereas in case that x is less than k, that side is zero, and that situation that time is present, and then you see this k cancels this minus k, and this minus x cancels this x. So indeed, we have here a slightly different representation of that positive part in terms of z function 
plus Z positive part. And we have seen that in the proof of the call uh, put parity for European uh, call options and put options. So and the advantage is that the function X is mapped to K minus X positive part is clearly a continuous and bounded function. So it's bounded from above by um, um, K and it's bounded from below by zero. Um, so we can apply the previous theorem to this put option first, which tells us that the limit of the arbitrage free price of these put options converges to e to the minus rt times the expected value of k minus s10 e to the z, where z is this desired normal distributed random variable. So we only have to address that term and its convergence. Well, so let us compute the arbitrage free price of S1n dn minus k, which is nothing else but the arbitrage free price of the discount claim. So I consider this particular claim here. So and now you see this first ratio gives us simply x1n evaluated at a time point t capital N, whereas the second term over here gives us simply the term e to the minus rt times k. But now we have here the martingale measure and we know that this term x1 n t n is a martingale under q n. So if I con now condition, so you, I use the definition of a conditional expectation, I condition on the sigma algebra f naught, which is the same as the sigma algebra f t naught. I simply get here the value x1 n at the point, time point zero, which is now a deterministic quantity and is nothing else but the value S10 due to the fact that our numerator in this particular Cox-Ross Rubinstein model at time point zero is equal to one. So we have seen that we can have an explicit expression of the arbitrage free price of that expression over here in terms of um, z random variable s10 minus e to the minus r times t times k. Now I would like to do the following. I would like to cons uh, compute the following Laplace transform of that random variable z which we have seen previously, namely a, where z is a normal distribution with this particular mean and this particular variance. And I claim the result is e to the r capital T. So why is that true? It's not complicated. Write down the explicit, uh, this expected value explicitly. So that's this kind of um, a Gaussian integral. And again, I substitute now the term over here by y in order to get um, standard normal distribution. So if I do so, I get first of all this desired prefactor, 1 over square root of 2 pi. Then you see I get the term e to the uh, minus uh, 1 half times y squared. And um, in that term over here, so the e to the z term is replaced by, so we have to replace that by that term, uh, r minus sigma squared over 2 times t uh, plus y times sigma times square root of t. So this r times t term I take out. So this is here. And the resulting term, I take out the factor minus one half. So I end up with uh, sigma squared t. So this coming from that term over here, minus two times sigma times square root of t, which comes from this denominator. Uh, and y uh, squared comes from the density of the standard normal distribution. But you see, that's nothing else but a, a, a second binomial formula. Namely, that's nothing else but y minus sigma times square root of t squared. And then we can do the following. We can simply do another substitution and we shift that back to zero, which does not change the prefactor. And in that way, we see 
that the resulting integral is simply equal to 1, meaning the result is e to the r times capital T. So why is that useful? So what I would like to do now is I take exactly that term over here, I multiply and divide it by that term, and then I replace that term here by simply that expected value. And in doing so, I get the following expression. So the uh, limit of the arbitrage free price of our, of our call option we are interested in was simply the, this term over here, namely the price of our risky share at time point zero minus e to the minus r times capital T D, um, times k. So this term over here I can multiply and divide by that term. So then I get, I can take it out. So I have here e to the minus r times capital T. And then I get into the picture that an um, expected value of e to the Gaussian uh, random variable, which is which has that particular mean and that particular variance, and I can also take that k inside. And on the other hand, we have seen that the uh, limit of um, European input option is simply given by the following formula, namely e to minus rt times the expected value of that positive part between k minus s10 e to the z. And now I can again write these two terms under one expected value and I can take advantage of the fact as we did here, namely I have now that sum which I can write down as that positive part and in that way I get the desired um, formula for the arbitrage free price of a European call option in the limit as n tends to infinity. So this was part one. And in the second part, I simply would like to derive that formula over here, which we have seen. Well, for that, I um, start simply writing down what we have. So the arbitrage free price, so the black skulls price of our call option. So it's nothing else but the following integral. So I simply write down what is um, um, the formula in terms of an integral, namely it's the Gaussian integral of z function over here, s10 e to the z minus k times this density. And again, I do a substitution to get here um, the density of a nor standard normal distribution. And you see the result is then the following. It's this prefactor e to the minus rt. So normalization of that Gaussian density meaning one over square root of two pi multiplied by this density, and here I have now the desired expression, namely S10 times e to the um, r minus sigma squared over 2 times t plus sigma uh, squared of t times y. And now you can ask the following, when is that term, so that first factor larger than capital K? So this first factor is larger than capital T, if and only if, y is larger than the logarithm of s10 divided by capital T minus rt divided by sigma or square root of um, t plus one sigma half times square root of t. So what you do, you divide, you take the logarithm of both sides, you bring that term on the other side and you divide by that term over here. And that's exactly the way I derive that formula. And I would like to abbreviate that first term, so the first sum simply by h, and leave the second as it is. So, and then I split the integral into two integrals, namely, I have here the first integral, namely going from, in case that h is going from sigma half times square root of t to infinity of that term, minus, and then here I have the same integral but with, with this parameter k. So this is coming from that term over here. And now let me remind you that the integral from h um, plus sigma over 2 times square root of t to infinity is nothing else but the distribution function of a standard normal distribution from the parameter minus 
that value. So in that way, I get here, here's the typos, minus h, uh, minus sigma over two times square root of t. So here I corrected, here I forgot it. And in that term over here, I simply um, use the following observation, namely that this um, difference over here, when we take out this r times t term, is again the form of the second binomial formula. So hence we get that expression over here. And then we do another substitution by substitution by substituting y minus sigma times square root of t by some parameter y prime. And in that way, we shift, simply shift that lower bound to minus sigma over two times square root of t. And if we now use that representation over here, we end up with a distribution function of the standard normal distribution of the parameter minus h plus sigma over two times square root of t. And that concludes then the proof. And here's a last remark about the, the Greeks, which you may um, face with in a financial engineering lecture, namely the delta of the European, no, of the black scores price of the European Union call option is nothing else but the derivative with respect to the initial price of our risky security. The gamma is the second derivative of our black scores price with respect to the uh, um, price of the um, risky security at time point zero. And the theta is simply the uh, time derivative with respect to maturity. So I take first the derivative and then I plug in a capital T. So, and you see this delta has something to do with our uh, delta hedging. Uh, strategy. There we have seen our delta hedging strategy was derived in terms of uh, increments of that value function v which we have seen there. So this has something to do with the change of our um, hedging strategy when we change the price of our risky security at time point zero. This describes somehow the, the change of the strategy depending on the price and that's a change in terms of the maturity and then it turns out if you now do the computation that you can derive the following formula for the value of um, uh, vk core namely it solves the following equation namely that r times as uh, this function v call k at the position x times t is equal to r times x times delta xt plus one half sigma squared x squared times gamma of xt minus theta of xt and you see that's a partial differential equation we have written down for this function uh, vk so if you plug in you see that you have the first derivative of vk in x the second derivative of vk in x and the first derivative in time of uh, vkx so if you want to compute now um, the black scholes price of a European Union call option in this continuum limit, then you can also alternatively evaluate um, uh, the, the resulting partial differential equation.